<laughs> can we make Vanessa's uh, video a little bigger? I'm not sure if we can, Well, it'll work that way. Hey, Mike. That's okay. I mean, I think the slides are the more important thing. Yeah. Screen. There we go. We should probably get started. So let's not us with it too much. Okay. Okay. All right. Vanessa, you ready? Yep, I'm ready. Um, well, probably a little more volume at that end. Give us a sound test. Okay. Hello. 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 Yeah. Right. That's, that's a good volume. Great. So, um, I'm delighted to introduce Vanessa Watson from the University of Cape Town, uh, where is she? Where she is a professor of architecture planning and geomatics, and a fellow of the university. Um, Dr. Watson is a graduate of the University of Witzwatersrand. Uh, she's published on uh, southern planning issues, southern perspective on planning theory, the new urban agenda, African planning education. Um, she is the Global South editor of Urban Studies and the editor of the European Journal of uh, Development Research. She's on the editorial board of four different journals, and she was the senior consultant to the UN Habitat Global Report on Human Settlements in 2009. Um, and um, the title of today's talk is Planning in and for Cities of the Global South. Um, Vanessa, we, uh, uh, we're really indebted to you. You, uh, you flew from Cape Town here in December to give this talk, and then we got snowed out, um, and we had to return home without the talk, but we're, uh, we're really uh, delighted to have you with us today. I think it's about uh, 6.30 in the afternoon in Cape Town, and of course right. it's uh, just afternoon here in Atlanta, and uh, we're, uh, we're really pleased uh, uh, to have you with us and look forward to what you have to say. Hey Bruce, thank you so much for your original invitation. And thank you so much for setting this up again. Um, but just please tell me, has it stopped snowing? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there hasn't been snow in a while in Atlanta. And the question Ever since I was there, there, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, well, great to, great to speak to you, even if um, by distance. And uh, let me say my piece and then we can open it up for questions. I want to, I want to start off by, by summarizing the, I suppose, the key arguments that I'm going to make in, in this talk. And I suppose the important point here is that for a long time I have felt that a key problem in planning theory and practice is the fact that we don't understand or we don't appreciate just how different different parts of the globe can be. 
And when I say the globe, I am referring to, I can refer to countries, regions, neighborhoods, cities, whatever scale you choose. Major differences across the world. And I don't just mean difference in terms of what you see when you go to a new place. I'm talking about culture, I'm talking about politics, environment, um, the nature of, of cities and towns and rural areas and everything else. And yes, we're in a globalized world and some places are quite similar to others, but I'm arguing that there is deep and major difference if we look uh, across our world. And I'm, I'm afraid, and this has been my, uh, my deep concern, is that almost always we come across planning theories uh, that, uh, that claim a relevance to everywhere. <coughs> Excuse me. They might have been developed in a particular context. They might reflect the problems of a particular context. But they never specify, this is my theory for place X. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> they do, in fact, we can say they are, they're place blind. And then so often we get the tendency to what is called best practice. Practitioners who say a planning intervention worked well in place X, it will surely work well in, in the rest of the world. So in other words, that universalizing of ideas and practices almost becomes the norm. We almost accept it as, as something that is, is obvious. And my argument is that, in fact, most of these ideas are based on a whole lot of assumptions about place that are never raised, never vocalized, and never taken into account. And that's a huge problem, I believe. So my work has been developing what I call a southern planning theory perspective. And I'm not alone in this. There, there, there are certainly other academics, theorists, practitioners around the world who talk about a southern planning theory perspective. Um, but we are not many. It is, it is a small and, 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 and relatively marginal voice, I think, that, that we are, are hearing here. And whenever I table the word southern planning theory, of course, there are always immediately a whole lot of objections. So I straight away have to say what Southern planning theory is not. It's not a geographically defined set of planning ideas. I'm not saying that here is a theory or a practice for the global north and here is one for the global south. What I'm saying is that what we need to recognize is that the globe is made up of cores and peripheries, cores and peripheries within cores and peripheries. Those are continually shifting and changing. And much of that core periphery relationship is shaped by colonialism and, and imperialism. It is also not only planners who talk about a southern perspective. Um, sociologist Raywin Connell, who has written extensively, calls southern theory a way of emphasizing relations of authority, exclusion between metropole and periphery. Anthropologists, Komarov and Komarov, talk about Southness as critique, as eccentricity. It's a way of speaking back to the North and it's undeclared parochialism. So it's really, it's, it's a philosophical positioning, if you like. It's a set of ideas that argue that we have to think planning from place and context. In other words, I'm talking inductive theorizing rather than deductive theorizing. The one thing we have in common across many parts which I will be talking about is a very large chronically poor population, and that is a, is a, is a common characteristic. But we know those exist in the global north as well. Now what I want to do just to emphasize my point, is to talk through some aspects of place difference that maybe if you have traveled, then you would be aware of these. If you have not traveled that much or have not looked at the international 
uh, literature on planning, you may be less aware of these. So let me skim through some aspects of, of place difference. And probably one very key one is, is urbanization, the level of urbanization. What this graph is showing, okay, is levels of urbanization by continent. And immediately on the left-hand side, you can see the difference between what are usually called developed countries and developing countries. Developing countries heading in by 2050 to have very extensive urbanization, very large numbers of people living in cities. If you look to the two bars to the right of that, just look at Africa and Asia and the rate at which they are going to urbanize, the numbers of extra people that will be in cities by 2050. But if you look at the bars on the right, look at LAC, that's Latin American countries. And what this is showing is that the global south itself is also very different. It's also very diverse. So we must be careful not to homogenize these places. It's important, I think, to understand when we're understanding place, we must understand history. And history has had a profound impact on urbanization. If we're wondering why Latin America is so highly urbanized and not urbanizing very fast anymore, one thing we can look back on is its history of colonization. Colonized first and withdrawal of colonial powers very early on. It was what we call Southern Urbanization Phase One. Asia colonized next um, and with colonial powers withdrawing from it, urbanization phase two. Africa is the last continent in the world to go through an urban transition. That is going through its urban transition right now. So these continents are, they're all part of the global south, but they are very different, and you have to think back to history, and particularly colonial history. If you just have a look at cities which are growing the fastest, the red dots and the red squares, you can see that they are concentrating in certain parts of the world. Certainly China, as we know, is, is, has cities which are growing very rapidly. But look where a lot of those red dot, dots are. Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa and, and the Middle East. And the boxes which show the biggest cities, okay, many of them in China, Asia, and the Middle East. Only one in Africa, Lagos. Africa is not heading down the road of mega, mega cities for some or other reason. Other parts of the world are. So again, these major differences. So currently, Africa's population is largely rural. We are into our urban transition. But look how quickly that urban population will grow. We can say in Sub-Saharan Africa that most cities are going to double in size in 20 years' time. Now, for cities that are already poorly planned, poorly serviced, weak economies, okay, the prospect of those cities doubling in size in 20 years is mind-blowing. How are those cities going to cope with these huge populations? How are they going to be managed? What is going to be the impact of things like climate change and disaster risk? So this is a very big issue that you probably would not come across, and not in the same way if you were planning in North America or Europe or Australia. There are aspects of the African continent and others that make our planning task and our planning thinking very different. And I'm just looking at urbanization at the moment. Now, theory. Let me give you an example of how a particular theory about urbanization and industrialization, which was developed in the global north in the United States by one Rosto in the 1960s. And let me look at how applicable that kind of theory is across the world, just as an example. Some of you who have done economics um, may be familiar with this graph. 
Rostow was suggesting that all countries went through phases of economic growth from when they were small economies, traditional economies, to what he called the stage of high mass consumption. And Rostow argued back in the 60s that urbanization and industrialization correlated together. You get the two together. When you get, when you get industrialization, you get urbanization and, and rising incomes. And he was basing his theory on what had happened in the United States. But as theorists do, he was arguing this theory applies everywhere in the world. Okay? And there are economists who, who do, in fact, try and, and apply it today. And if you have a look at the graph on the left with the blue arrows, you will see that in certain parts of the global south, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Rostow's model was in fact holding. You have urbanization, you have industrialization, and you have rising incomes. So yeah, Rostow's model fits. But have a look at Africa. Where is that correlation? Okay, it just doesn't apply. What Africa is experiencing is very rapid jobless urban growth. We have the urbanization, we have the massive increase in the size of cities, but very little in the way of industrialization. South Africa is an exception. Let's leave that out of it. Talking sub-Saharan Africa, okay? Rapid, rapid urban growth without a developing economy. And that leads to all sorts of very particular problems, issues, the nature of settlements that are critically important for planners. We have to think about those. I've now, and this is maybe going to be a rather crude exercise, but I've tried to just highlight some of those differences between American cities, US cities, and African cities, just to show how different these aspects can be. If you look at employment, 66% of the urban population in sub-Saharan African cities are in the informal sector. They're in informal work. That's huge, and it's not changing. Informal, the informal economy is simply growing. Whereas in most American cities, 95% um, possibly is, is of people are employed. And that's, uh, that's a very different scenario. Poverty, African cities, 43% below the poverty line. US cities, average 14%, but we know some American cities have much higher rates um, below the poverty line. But again, really major difference between the two continents. What about living in slums, informal settlements? In African cities, 62% of the population live in, in slums. In American cities, we know that there are areas of high poverty, high poverty neighborhoods. Um, on average, 13.8% and, and certainly some cities much higher, but it's a huge difference between American cities and African cities, just to take two examples. And interestingly, how we define the middle class. In Africa, the middle class is defined as households who spend $20 a day, okay, or $7,200 per annum. In the US, the middle class are people who earn between 32 and 100,000. We don't have earnings uh, for Africa. But to look at this graph quickly, what this shows for Africa is how on the left-hand side of the graph, 60,8% of the population live on $2 a day. Okay, that is poverty. That is extensive poverty. If you look at the other side of the graph, people who are classified as rich, okay, is only 4.8% of the population, and they're only spending $20 a day. Now, in America, that would be very poor people, perhaps, or middling poor people who would spend $20 a day. In Africa, those are the rich. So these huge differences in, in, in definitions, in how people live, in how they consume, uh, and so on. And, and just to make the point that what I've done in these graphs is skim 
in a very superficial way across some place differences. I could talk about many more. I haven't talked about culture. I haven't talked about politics. I haven't talked about religion. I haven't talked about political systems, governance, institutional systems. Those as well also vary hugely from one part of the world uh, to another and within the global south. So my argument is that difference, place difference, is profound. And as planners, we need to acknowledge it, recognize it, work with it. Now, let me move on because I think a question is, well, this global south thinking, but what is it producing? Have new planning ideas or concepts emerged from the global south? Is there a global south theory? And no, there isn't, for very important reasons. And what I'm going to do is to draw your attention to some of the key planning theorists who are thinking through what are the contributions of global south theorizing in planning. And I think it's important to tie these back to individuals who live in a particular place because their work and their thinking is usually shaped by the places they live in and the things they encounter every day. So here, for example, and this is somebody whose work you may have read, Oren Yiftichel, <clears throat> Ben Gurion University in, in, in Israel, and his work has been around the Bedouin Arab villages and how Israel has used state planning to marginalize and eradicate them. So this is where he lives. This is what makes him think about planning every day. And this is what he writes about. And he has developed theories, if you like, that try and explain what he sees in the Negev. And he produces, he produced the concept of ethnocracy. In other words, ethnically inspired planning. Gray spaces, he talks about. In other words, he's saying that Bedouin villages are these gray spaces, which partly exist in reality, but they are also ignored. They are eradicated from the maps, the planning maps um, that cover the territory. They hover between the legal and the illegal of formal planning. They live in a, in, a, in, a, in a middle zone, a gray space. And he's used those concepts to talk about other parts of the world where we have increasingly uh, what we might call apartheid planning. It's not only uh, Israel that, that you could point to in that sense. So Oren Niftichel is an important southern planning theorist. Ananya Roy is somewhat closer to home, I'm sure for many of you. You probably know her work and know about her at UCLA. And she grew up in India. She grew up in Delhi, did her research work in Delhi. And she's produced, based on that experience, some very interesting new theories about informality. And her papers, some 10 years ago now, said that what we learn from Indian cities is that informality is not just informal traders and informal work. She said in India, the state, the government is informal. In the same way as informal traders, it does not follow the rules and the laws that are set down. You cannot really distinguish between the actions of the state and the actions of illegal informal traders uh, or informal squatters, if you like. So this turning the whole notion of informality on its head to say the problem why we can't plan our cities is because the state is informal. Interesting, whole new interesting concept. Here's some more people that are close to home for you. James Holston, Berkeley. Uh, Faranak Miriftar from Illinois. Uh, Faranak grew up in Iran um, and did some of her university degrees there and has been profoundly influenced by the place she came from. James Holston has researched extensively in Brazil, and he has put forward the notion of insurgent planning. And this is a way of thinking about state-society relationships and planning. 
It's not a cozy, collaborative, commutative planning. It's insurgency. It's violent. It's, it, 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 it mobilizes citizens to claim their land and housing. Faranak Miriftab has talked about how insurgency creates invited spaces where the state might invite communities in, and invented spaces where communities create their own spaces to negotiate or conflict with the state. Insurgent planning, a very useful concept in the Global South. Here's somebody I've written with, Gautam Ban, Indian Institute of Human Settlements in Bangalore. And he's written about the whole concept of the public interest, which is very important in planning. And how in, in, in Delhi, again, the courts have taken over the concept of public interest. In fact, in Delhi, he argues that it is now the courts that do planning. They're not planners anymore. It's the courts that do it. And the courts claim to be acting in the public interest when they justify evictions uh, in the name of governance, development, and order. So here's the concept of the public interest turned on its head, used in a very different way to most mainstream theorists. And here's Libby Porter, now working and living in Australia, and she does post-colonial planning. And she's been asking the question, how do indigenous people in Australia speak back to the state in settler colonial territories where the settler remains. And of course, in Australia, the settler remains and, and controls planning. And she's argued that planning tends to normalize a whole set of concepts and practices like zoning, uh, for example, um, that are seen as, as seen as a standard way of doing things. But in fact, they come from the West. They come from a particular concept. And they are imposed on peoples, on groups of people, who have a very different sense of what management of territory, management of nature, management of the land uh, could be like. So it's, it's, it's a form of imposition. It's a form of, of, of domination, if you like. So a large theory on post-colonial planning. <clears throat> my own concepts, um, and I've learnt from my uh, study, growing up and study in African cities, and, and being in Africa has shaped my way of seeing the world, and it's shaped my approach to planning. These are the kinds of things that one sees every day, certainly in South African cities, communities, civil society, in protest, claiming their rights, not happy at all to sit down and collaborate with local government. Out on the streets, blocking the roads, claiming their rights. A very different form of state society engagement in planning. I've used the term conflicting rationalities um, to, as an alternative, if you like, to collaborative and, and communicative planning. And I've, I've suggested that the thinking behind collaborative and communicative planning, which came from the United States, from the UK, from Europe, very good ideas, may work very well in parts of your context, may in fact work well in parts of my context, particularly in the wealthy white suburbs of Cape Town, but for large parts of my city and other cities, these, this way of going through or undertaking participatory planning doesn't really work at all. We've got to understand conflict rather than just consensus, because conflict here and in many other African countries is usually the heart of the planning process. So I've argued that we must recognize deep difference and conflicting worldviews from planners on the one hand and communities on the other. And it's shaped by what I've called a located politics of difference. And it's imbued with power and rationality. And colonial and the post-colonial influence is, is key here. So I've talked about 
conflicting ration rationalities. And I have a book that's just come out this month, uh, which, which deals with that. And I said, this is a major tension in planning between the state, okay, which is techno-managerial, the usually a bureaucratic approach to state planning, perhaps less so in the United States, but state planning very strong in Africa and other parts of, of the East. And the state often in alliance with other actors like property developers, um, and they stand almost in opposition. They have a very different view of the world to marginalized and impoverished urban populations who are desperately trying to survive under conditions of informality or illegality. So I'm saying there are two very different and clashing worldviews here. The chances of reaching consensus about what a plan should look like, you may be lucky, but more often these fall into conflict. And you've got to look at this interface between these clashing logics. And, and are, there, are there ways of connecting and building across the interface? Because we don't want to simply throw up our hands and say, therefore, we can't plan or therefore we can't communicate. But we have to look at ways of communicating in very different ways. And we have to learn from practices here. So here's a very important practice which I've learned from. That is the process of co-production. And I suggest we use the concept of co-production in planning rather than collaboration. And here we've learned these practices from an international NGO called Slum Dwellers International, who have been operating uh, in Cape Town for a long time with impoverished communities. And co-production is when communities organize with the NGO to establish a partnership with government on planning issues, but they set the terms of the negotiation. They set, they set the agenda, not the state. And they have power. And these communities have power, one important reason is because they have knowledge. And they have gone out and done the community surveys and the mapping, and they have a good idea of what is going on in those informal settlements. They have funds from community savings, and they get technical expertise via the NGO. And that network, that global network is hugely helpful here. Kampala, Uganda, a very good example of how co-production around informal settlements has been very, very successful. So it's a different way of looking at participation. It assumes power in the communities rather than power in the state. And we've seen it can work. Right, I was asked to look as well at some of the innovative practices in pedagogy and curricula and some of the innovative practices um, in, in practice. So let me refer to those. And Bruce, I think uh, another 10 minutes if I'm okay. I'm sure, Vanessa. We, we advertise the session um, till 1.45, which is another okay. 45 right. minutes. And so okay. uh, I think we can split between your talk and questions as you wish. Fine, okay, I've probably got another 10 minutes and then we can go to questions. Perfect. So, pedagogy, planning curricula. I have been a member of an organization called the Association of African Planning Schools and there are many equivalent organizations like this, ACSP in the United States, ESOP in Europe um, and the UK and so on. These are organizations of planning schools that come together to work around education and curricula. And the African Planning Association, which now has 53 planning schools as a membership, um, and the red dots show where those schools are, and you can see they spread across the continent. So it's been a, it's been a very useful network of planning academics when we want to talk about planning education. And what we did some years ago was to think, how as an organization can we put forward a new kind of planning curriculum? 
Because what happens in most planning schools in, in African cities is that they teach a Western dominated, often outdated, often outdated from the 1950s and 60s uh, planning curriculum that has been imported from the UK or Germany or, or France. And we have argued that those planning curricula, that way of teaching planning, is focused on orderly, controlled, modern cities. And really it doesn't work when you're talking about the realities of African cities today. Rapid growth, huge informality, very different to the cities where these planning curricula uh, came from. So we have argued that we need curricula which are, and we need planning which is more enabling than controlling. We, do, we need to think about creative problem solving in planning, like co-production, rather than thinking of a set of rules that you simply apply, zoning rules, regulatory rules. We need to think about a more flexible and empathetic approach between planners and communities which they plan with. And understanding and recognizing the cultural difference that occurs between different communities and between planners and the people they work with. So we structured a model curriculum around five key themes that are important in African cities. Uh, this was after extensive debate um, across the, Afri Afri the arts planning schools. And we said the key issues which should shape a curriculum are informality, climate change, spatial planning and infrastructure development, actor collaboration and access to land. And we brought those as key subjects into our model curriculum. We, in doing this, we signed an MOU with Slum Dwellers International, and they helped us develop these ideas and ideas about planning and teaching planning to respond to those kinds of problems. And what we came up with was a, a model planning curriculum. Very general, could be adapted to context, and what happened in 1914 was that the University of Zambia agreed to pilot this model curriculum as a master's curriculum. Very exciting. We never thought we would find a university prepared to do this. It was a brand new uh, postgraduate planning school um, and they adopted our model curriculum almost word for word. And even more amazing was that the Vice Chancellor of the University of Zambia signed an MOU with Slum Dwellers International in Lusaka to agree that both the NGO and the community members would come into the university to teach about slums and about planning. Now, most African universities are highly bureaucratic, highly technical, and I was absolutely amazed that the Vice Chancellor even agreed to do this, but this was a huge step forward. This program started in 2014, a lot of support from government, it's been doing incredibly well. We're very proud of that achievement. But we've had issues and concerns at my university as well. And over the last three years, we have been swamped by student protests across all the South African universities calling for not only free higher education, but also a decolonization of the curriculum across all the faculties, across all the subjects. On my campus, for a long time, there has been a, a very large statue, which you can see in the picture, and it's the statue of Cecil John Rhodes, who was a British colonial industrialist, who if you look at what he did, uh, was involved in large-scale exploitation of agriculture, of minerals, and so on. And the student protest crystallized around this notion of roads must fall. That was the symbol, if you like. The statue had to go. You can see it all tied up with black bags and sticky tape there. 
and the curriculum has to be decolonized. And the statue did go. The university agreed to remove the statue. And it's now lying somewhere in a storage area somewhere in Cape Town. And certainly in my planning school, we spent a lot of time trying to think through what would be the basic principles of the curriculum. And these are the seven ideas um, that we came up with. And some of these, I must say, we I think we were already uh, taking into account, but others were new for us. So we have to, when we talk about planning, and we have to take into account history and how history has shaped cities and places, and we must recognize the ongoing impact of coloniality. The colonists have gone, we have political independence, but those imperialist relations of exploitation continue. Okay, so we must recognize coloniality. As academics and as students, we must reflect on our own values and standpoints in all of planning. Okay, we all we all think from a certain place. Okay, and that we must be conscious of, we must think about. We must value in our teaching, experiential learning local knowledge and empathy. Experiential learning, send our students out into the communities to work with them, not to sit in a classroom or a studio and simply hear about them. To actually get their feet dirty in informal settlements, to sit there and have tea, to sit there, to walk around, to experience the everyday lives of people who live in informal settlements to engage with them, to dialogue with them, to discuss what their problems are and how they would see their environments as different. That, we argue, is the way to learn. We talk about situated learning. We must understand how theories and ideas come from particular contexts, rather than ideas from nowhere, okay? uh, which, as I said before, many theories are based on that assumption. We need to question and diversify what are called the authoritative texts and icons. And that's very hard because most of the literature that comes into our libraries comes from the Global North. And it's written by authors in the Global North. And most of our planning journals, the editors, are from the Global North. And many of the articles are from the Global North. And as the Urban Studies Global South editor, I have been trying to change this and realize it's actually really hard. There's big barriers to changing that. We also believe we need to talk with students a lot more than we ever used to. We need to talk about diversity. We need to talk about race. We need to talk about identity. We need to talk about unhealed wounds. And that's both in terms of, of gender, race, ethnicity, and religion. And we now have long afternoon sessions where we talk about these things to our students and hear their experiences firsthand. And then we need to get better diversity, staff diversity. Um, our, our student body is already quite diverse. And one way we do that is to bring in community organizers and Slum Dwellers International. We bring them into the classroom to teach. We call them community professors as a way of indicating that they have knowledge and suggesting whose knowledge counts. Us, maybe, yes, but people who live those everyday realities um, of, of the informal settlements. So that's been our journey on the question of, of decolonizing planning curriculum. And there is now at the University of Cape Town a transformation forum set up to discuss decolonization of curricula across all the faculties. And that's a process that's beginning. Okay, I'm moving on last now to some examples of innovative practices in the Global South. Now, this is really hard, believe it or not. It's very hard to find good, positive, innovative planning in Global South regions. And the main reason for that 
is because most planning in global south cities still slavishly follows northern planning and increasingly eastern planning as well. And here, for example, is the master plan for Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda in Africa. And just look at that picture. In fact, it was put together, the plan was put together by an American firm. I won't mention names. But this is, this is an imitation of, of Dubai or Singapore. In fact, in the back, you can see a building shaped like the one in London called the Gherkin. So this is, this is cut and paste of architecture from the global north that has now become incredibly popular in many African cities, large parts of India, in fact, across the global south. More and more city plans look like this. Vanessa, and my article slide. on, sorry? Before you leave that slide, I, I don't know if you were going to say this, the plan that you're showing us now received in 2007 an American Planning Association Outstanding Plan Award. I didn't want to say that, but you said it. Good. <laughs> yeah. And it's maybe just mentioning that, that Rwanda is a city where some 70% of the population have lived in informal settlements. It's a poor city. People survive off informal work. In this picture, you don't see any shacks, you don't see any slums, you don't see any informal traders. You see tall glass box buildings that will all depend on lifts and probably air conditioning, where the power supply is cut off frequently. And here is a plan that is put together for a population that simply doesn't exist in Rwanda. Now, Rwanda is a, is a, is a, is a highly state-controlled country, and they have pushed ahead to make this plan happen. And I'm told if you go to Rwanda now, what you see is that the informal settlements have been moved away, knocked down, and these kinds of buildings are starting to emerge. And it's, it's, it's happening. And where those poor communities have gone to, where they've been moved to, we really don't know. So this is, if I say what kind of planning is happening in the global south, I'm afraid it largely looks like this. If you want to look at innovative planning practices, you find little pilot projects scattered across Africa, some bigger ones in Latin America and, and Asia. The really good ones are bottom-up, community-based, small scale. Here is a project in, in Nairobi um, started by, again, a branch of Slum Dwellers International, Mungano Kabemoto. But the community has made the bricks. It has built these houses and it has paved the roads. They have done the work. And it fits incredibly well. Those houses that you see there are four stories high, but four square meters by four square meters. But into that, you can fit a whole extended household. And it's cheap. They can afford it. And it is for the community and by the community. And that's, that's good practice. We can look across the continents for other ways, other good planning ideas. Um, they're not easy to find. You can, you can certainly find examples where informal work has been incorporated into housing and homes, where governments have recognized the importance of public spaces to use as informal markets. Um, Zambia has a, had a program of developing public markets. They're really important in terms of food security. India, in recent years, passed a new act that protected informal markets in public spaces. So that was a big leap forward. Um, so these things are starting to happen. We can find small examples of new urban infrastructures and technologies which leapfrog the big conventional systems. 
and look at the more low carbon resilient options. Kenyans wind farms, for example. Growing, growing very rapidly. Managing waste picking, more jobs, less landfill. Domestic biogas programs, energy from waste, permaculture projects. BRT, which has been copied largely from Bogota, is starting to take off in cities, at least at some form of public transport. But really, you, you're breaking the barrel when you come to look for good planning practices in global south regions. So finally, and to wrap up, and then we can go to questions. Let me just try and, and repeat and pull together again what I see as the value of Southern theory and practice. And essentially what I'm talking about is not a new theory, not a theory for the South, not a set of practices for the South or which can say these are relevant everywhere, but rather a pluralization of theory and practice across the globe. Different theories, different ideas, which all relate back to the context from which they arose. And some of them may work in other parts of the world, but let's not take that for granted. I don't like to talk about a Southern theory. I, look, I like to talk about theory in the making, a Southern theory building project. We are still at the very early stages of thinking about a perspective on planning from the global south. We have a long way to go, not there yet. I'm thinking of meso level theorizing, in other words, maybe theories and practices that are relevant for regions, um, developed inductively from the bottom up, tested elsewhere very carefully perhaps, but not claiming universal applicability. <clears throat> These theories have a deep appreciation of context, difference, and conflict. And we come to the kind of understanding I'm talking about very often through case study research. So we, we, we deeply analyze and understand contexts, places within the wider frame of economy and society that tie parts of the world together. And post-colonial thinking, I think, is, is important here. So it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's still at the beginning. It has a long way to go. Um, and for me, it has been a very valuable perspective in terms of my thinking about planning. Thank you. Vanessa, thank you so much. So we have a, about a half hour, and uh, we'll yeah. take questions uh, from the floor. And um, I have uh, uh, the ability to control the uh, the camera, so I'll try to zoom in on people who are who are asking oh. questions, so you can see them. <laughs> um, At the moment, they're very small. <laughs> um, I, I, while people are thinking about their questions, I'm going to take the prerogative to ask the the first one, and. Um, uh, so maybe I'll try here to, <laughs> <laughs> to set an example. Yeah, there we go. So, of course, you know what I look like. But, um, yeah, Vanessa, you worked with UN Habitat on the 2009 Global Report on Human Settlements. Um, and you know that I worked with them on the International Guidelines for Urban and Territorial Planning. And we're both familiar with the new urban agenda that was passed in 2016. Um, the, these were all efforts that tried to identify best practices to be promulgated around the world, and Habitat and other institutions are working very hard to, uh, uh, to try and do just that these days, to, to take global principles and get them to be implemented uh, in all the UN member states, if not all the countries of the world. And um, listening to you talk today, um, I, I'm guessing that uh, you think there's some real problems with that approach, and I wonder your reaction to the Habitat Agenda and, uh, and how you would have us respond to it. Okay. Should I go ahead and answer that? Sure. Okay. So, Bruce, 
Let me start off by saying I, I, I really think SDG 11 and the new urban agenda was a huge leap forward for cities and for planning. Not only that the new urban agenda now applies to all cities of the world, global north and global south, but also there's a way of thinking about how all the SDGs must manifest themselves in cities. And I think it's really fantastic that when you look at SDG 11 and the new urban agenda, planning is up there as, as a central tool which, which can be used to achieve a new urban agenda. And I really liked many of the, the principles in the new urban agenda. For the first time, we have mention of principles such as, as inclusivity, equity, resilience. Um, it's, it's fantastic that, that that kind of recognition has come into urban development and to, and to planning. And just thinking about the African context where many countries have been anti-urban for many decades, have ignored cities. So the new urban agenda is, is a great leap forward. But when we talk about best practices, I think I would like to distinguish between principles and practice. I think it's, I think it's a great idea to be able to undertake case studies of places that have achieved successful planning and to be able to publish those and distribute those to other cities around the world. What is really important in that process, though, is that those case studies don't just indicate the planning outcomes, but indicate what it was about place which allowed those outcomes to happen. And I must say, somebody like Patsy Healy has been really important in drawing attention to that. I'm thinking of her most recent example about universalization and particularity. Case study research is important, but we've got to link it back to place. We've said this form of planning, this approach to planning worked, but it depended on this kind of government, this sort of institutional arrangement, this, store, this kind of financing system, this approach to laws, this land tenure system, so that when we look at a case study like that and ask, can it work elsewhere, we have to go back and say, well, can this other part of the world apply something like this? Do we have a similar context to apply it in? And maybe some ideas can work, but we have to start with understanding context. So I don't have a problem per se, with looking at case studies, looking at examples of good planning, but that research must quite explicitly be based on how context shaped that. Um, that would be my, my answer to your question. Thank you. So who's next? Okay, um, I, I can probably come in on you. We'll see. I shall. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and start, and I'll I'll try and catch up to you. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, my question is about financing, and in about financing. So in the yeah. context of so I'm from Jamaica, and the projects I work on are solid waste management and energy. And in thinking about financing, um, majority of the global so lots of the global so is getting financing from either international development agencies or overseas um, private partnerships. Um, if those entities are already biased towards a more um, global north perspective of what development is, how do you see planners um, financing these projects um, in other, in, with other type of relationships? If that question makes sense. So I, I think you are right that certainly in the past and even today, 
Much of the financing for Global South projects, urban projects, has come from the international agencies, and we know that the World Bank has been has been key there. I I always generalize about the World Bank because I have occasionally met some very sensitive people in the World Bank, but very often, um, you're quite right, those approaches, the financing mechanisms, the way projects are implemented um, comes with a, a global north understanding of, of, of how they should be rolled out. Often very little understanding of context and often very little post-implementation evaluation and monitoring to try and check whether these things work or not. Um, we know the World Bank's not the only agency that does that kind of funding. There's the African Development Bank, for example, in Africa that funds projects. Um, there are even NGOs that, that fund projects, so we can't generalize about that. But yes, you're right, very often it's, it's, it's Global North finance, and along with that comes Global North expertise and professionals. And one likes to see circumstances where the World Bank draws in local professionals, um, but that doesn't always happen. So I'm not that familiar with the Jamaica concept context, but certainly from the context I know, um, yeah, that finance comes with strings. And those strings are, are knowledge and technology. And not enough is attention given to, is, is this going to apply in this context? Is it going to work? So I agree, yeah. I, I wonder if I can ask a follow-up uh, about uh, China's engagement in Africa. China's been spending a lot of money on infrastructure in Africa in recent years. and. Um, the things that you just said about third-party funders, uh, how do they apply to the Chinese experience in Africa? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's quite interesting. I think the World Bank has been getting increasingly nervous about the way uh, Chinese state investment is, is moving into Africa. And China comes in in the same way that the World Bank has, comes in with loans or grant money, um, often at better interest rates than the World Bank. So frequently African governments are, are very happy to take Chinese loans um, and along with that Chinese expertise. And again, I don't want to generalize, but it's, it's very often the case that, uh, that we're seeing similar problems. Chinese companies that move into a part of the continent, bring their own labor force, okay, and their own, uh, their own professional force, construct the project, and then up and go. And one can point to, to all sorts of, of, of major projects, huge projects, many of them infrastructure and roads, um, that have been built that way. Now, a road is a road, Okay, but could have been built probably with local labor rather than Chinese labor. Could have been considered as a local economic development project rather than just China pouring money in. Um, and then there are, there are ongoing strings attached. China has, I mean, one very big project that um, China constructed was a satellite city outside Luanda uh, in Angola. And China offered to put up all the capital um, to build the city. I think it was for about 50, 60,000 people. Um, built the city, okay, and then left it up to the state as a loan to sell off the apartments, all of which were way, way, way too expensive for even the middle class in Luanda. And for ages, that satellite city stood empty. It was called the Chinese ghost town. There was a lot on BBC about it um, because people simply couldn't afford those apartments. So the Chinese company had not thought through what kind of apartments are we building for what sort of income groups? 
What happened in the end, the end of that story, was that the Angolan government took its whole housing subsidy that it should have been spending on informal settlement upgrade and put that towards the subsidy of these flashy new apartments to bring down their cost. And then the middle class in Luanda could afford to move into them and did. But there was a budget that was, that was completely redirected to trying to make up um, for a wrong project that had been executed um, by China. There, there are major Chinese projects going on uh, in Africa at the moment. There are port developments, there are new railroad developments, um, there are road developments. Um, there, are, there are Chinese companies moving into what we call land grab agricultural land to invest in large scale um, agriculture. And whether that product stays in Africa or goes back to China, uh, we will see. Not so much in South Africa. Um, we tend to, uh, we, in fact, we, we've probably been dealing with Russia in recent years more than China, particularly around nuclear power stations, which has been very problematic. Um, but the rest of the African continent, China is increasingly dominant, yes. Yes, um, just one more question. Um, so what are some of the examples you're seeing of um, alternative or more innovative funding mechanisms which um, reduce the inf that um, kind of influence to be a more global north kind of planned city or, or infrastructure project? Any examples that you have that are maybe collective economics or corporative economics or anything like that that you think is interesting? Okay, so I think I think more of the the good ideas are, are South African. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, uh, oh. Oh, I don't know if you can hear me, Vanessa. We lost your video and audio. Um, <laughs> her, her video is off. Bear with us, we'll see if we can get her back. Okay. Oh, Suddenly come back. There you are. Yeah. I think we heard the end of the answer, but uh, <laughs> I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't finished. I oh, haven't finished. Okay. So, so, so state finance in most African cities comes from uh, the export of resources, basic resources, minerals, natural resources, and the profits go back to central state. And very little of that finance is devolved to local government. The highly centralized uh, powers, functions, and, and finance. So any projects are, are usually very top-down, funded by national government, um, with very little connection to what is going on on the ground in cities. And that's mostly because municipalities are cash-strapped. Now, South African municipalities are, are rather different because they they are allowed to gather property rates. They do that quite effectively. And property rates are quite a big source of income for most local authorities. So local authorities in, in South Africa can draw on national funds for infrastructure, but they also depend on, on their own funding, their own budgets, and their own projects. And, and that is where you can, you're able to do that combination of national funding and local funding that I think you get, you get better ideas um, starting to develop. So, so again, very hard to find innovative ideas um, across the continent. Um, 
better ideas perhaps uh, where where you have a good solid municipal finance system and that's that's key to a lot of things I think um, Vanessa um, so yeah. um, uh, this is a question about scale so there's a sense at which um, the uh, core lessons that you summarized at the end were about empowering people uh, to do community building and it looked primarily at the scale of the settlements right of, of neighborhoods of that scale um, and, but the problems of uh, African cities are not just at the scale of the, the the smaller settlements but at the scale of the urban agglomerates um, and I'm wondering if there's been any uh, work done in Africa or in the planning schools around what it means to try to create a, a city of five to ten million people um, when the dominant pattern is one of informal settlements mixed with more formal kinds of development patterns. Uh, is, is there an emerging sense of what an urban theory might look like? So what is happening at the moment, I mean, think back to my picture of, of Kigali, where, where you have plans for, for very large new cities, um, they largely happen through governments inviting in foreign consultants, um, either from the West or from the East, and the whole process of of drawing up the plans rests largely with those consultants. And it's all the way from engineers to property developers to planners and it, 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 the whole lot. So is so, there a counter so, voice? Is, is, there there a a? Counter, is there a counter voice to that? No, no. There's, there, there's to the extent that organizations, global organizations like Slum Dwellers International, and Slum Dwellers International sits, for example, on the board of an organization called Cities Alliance, which is quite influential across Africa and beyond. An organization like Cities Alliance, which is, is uh, strongly influenced by NGOs, can start to put forward that voice, and they certainly do. It's a question of capacity and, and funding again. There are many African governments who realize that their urbanization rates and levels are alarming. They realize they will have to either expand their current cities or develop new ones, but they don't have the expertise and they don't have the, the capital to do it. So most of them have resorted to, to calling on foreign funding, um, foreign expertise and, and, and consultants. They, they certainly, uh, some of them, and, and again, South Africa has been far more controlling in this respect. It's been far more difficult for foreign developers to simply come in and do what they will. But in many other countries, um, foreign investors have had carte blanche, as it were. You, you could, you could take, take Kenya, for example. So Nairobi, which is growing incredibly fast, has a 2030 metropolitan plan. This was drawn up by central government. They argue that urbanization is happening really rapidly, so they have set up a whole series of, of satellite cities on the plan, okay, on the diagram. And then they sit back and wait for foreign investors to come and say, right, we'll take this one and build it. And that is happening. Techno City, Konza City. Uh, Techno City, for example, where, where a large Russian-backed um, foreign investor came in and bought up land, promising to build a city that looked a bit like um, the Dubai example. The state, in many of these cases, has very little control over what happens. It's, it's often quite pleased to see that something is going ahead. 
that in future they may be able to say we have world-class cities. Uh, that is very attractive to politicians. They don't see it as a problem. What they do see, what many politicians do see as a problem, are sprawling informal settlements, um, uh, dirt, informality, disorder. That, as far as they're concerned, is something that they have to sweep under the carpet as fast as they possibly can. Um, what they're looking for are the, uh, the world-class, iconic models um, that many of the overseas investors are, are proposing. And what I'm saying for Africa goes for India as well. So South Africa is different. Um, municipalities much stronger, able to say, no, we don't like that. We want it different, differently. Um, but most other African countries, its central government, with very little power or willingness to shift things in a different direction. Now, now here, and let me get back to Bruce's first question, increasingly governments are going to be pushed into taking account of Sustainable Goal 11 and the new urban agenda. And they're going to sign up to commitments and agreements through the UN that say, yes, we do believe in the principles of the new urban agenda. We do believe in inclusivity and pro-poor policies and resilience and so on. So increasingly, I think, national governments are, are paying lip service, perhaps, um, to all the good principles of the new urban agenda. But when you look at what is actually happening on the ground, uh, it's rather different. And it's going to be a huge task for you and Habitat and anyone involved in the new urban agenda to try and convince governments that they have to see things differently. They actually do have to follow the principles of the new urban agenda. Um, and they're a long way from that at the moment. Serena, you had your hand. Oh, yeah. Uh, you really don't. You don't. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, I think the community professors idea is really cool, and I wondered if you could tell us more about how that worked and how it was received by faculty and students. The start of your question, I didn't quite hear it. Maybe, oh, maybe you want to come closer to the speaker? Yeah. <laughs> that way, the film won't be on you. You can zoom out, though. It's going to get weird if I get it. <laughs> I'll get to you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Got you, Bruce. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us more about the community professors. I think that's a cool idea. And community I wonder, professor. Oh, OK. Yeah, and uh, yeah. how they, it was received by uh, faculty. Um, and how you integrated that into classroom. Okay, okay. Um, so let me talk about um, a studio which I was part of, part of at the University of Cape Town. And this was a, a class of maybe about 20 master students. And their project was to take an informal settlement in Cape Town and try and understand what was going on in that informal settlement and then come up with a set of plans um, for, for upgrade. What we did was we never just go into a community as, as faculty or as students. We work with an NGO. And in this case, it was Slum Dwellers International that has a branch uh, in Cape Town. And this NGO had been working with the community um, on upgrade ideas for a while, so they were embedded there, if you like. We, we, took, we took our students into that community maybe three times a week. This was not a, it was not an in-out. They went into communities accompanied by NGO members, and they negotiated and talked to and discussed with community organizers. And there was endless discussion about what the problems were, what the issues were, and, and what could be done. 
One of the, in, in this case, the informal settlement was built on an old landfill site. And the, the health challenges from building on an old landfill site and, and the leakage of noxious chemicals, of course, is extreme. And there was, there was a really interesting conundrum for the students because as much as they said to the community, it's really unhealthy to live on a landfill site, okay, the community would say, we're healthy, we're fine, and we're not moving, okay? So what do you, what do, you do as a planner there? How do, you, how do you negotiate that? But in that process, what we did was often the students went to the community but several times the community was bussed into the university. And when I say the community, I mean uh, organizing committee, maybe 10, 20 people. And then what we do is the students would put up their ideas on posters, pin them up on the wall, and do formal presentations to the community. And the community would be there as, as almost sort of examiners. They were there to comment on where they thought they were right or going wrong, um, where they had good ideas or bad ideas, and we called them community professors. It worked when we had another project where we decided that the community together had to go and make presentations to the municipality to try and persuade them to get involved in the upgrade. So we put together the community members and the students into groups, and each group had some community members, some students. And those groups had to work on posters, presentations that identified the problems and then identified some, some solutions. And that was fantastic, where you're not just presenting either way, but you're actually working together in a group. Um, that, was a, that was fantastic. So, Different ways of doing it. The uh, University of Zambia um, course has, has done that kind of thing frequently. Um, brought the community in to talk in the lecture rooms to give, um, or to critique posters and, and work that's, that's put up on the wall. So that's, that's how we've done it. And, and being very explicit about where we think knowledge of different kinds lies. Yes, we have knowledge of a certain kind, expertise. Community members have other kinds of knowledge, uh, which are also important to what we do. So we're, we're at the announced uh, end time of the session, but I thought I'd ask if there was one more question. And uh, I, I know some people may have to go, and if you do, please don't let us know. Okay. Lee. Yeah. Um, a large part of slum upgrading projects is the attempt to formalize informal settlements. And you talked a lot about Global North ideas, and I was wondering if, in your opinion, that this is one of those Global North ideas. Yes, in a way. Because I think, I think for planners in practice, they have, they have a vision of what a good environment is like. And often this comes from their training, um, comes from their experience, okay? And a good upgrade project will probably involve formalization. Now, it doesn't have to. <clears throat> those, those upgrade projects which have gone forward via co-production, okay? They look very different. Certainly, there is infrastructure that needs to come in. Okay. There are certainly roads that need to be made. Um, but what is different about upgrade when co-production happens is that A, the community is involved, and B, everything that is done is affordable. Because the the key problem with upgrade of the formalization type is that almost inevitably community members can't afford the result. And when I say can't afford, it means they usually have to pay rates and taxes of some kind. 
They may be getting electricity. They may be getting water for the first time. Those costs have to be factored in. They may be given freehold parcels. The rates on that have to be factored in. So, so yes, in some ways, upgrade is and can be a, a step towards something more formal. Okay, How it's done and the kind of image that planners work towards is, is crucially important. And when it's done with NGOs and when it's done with communities, upgrade can happen slowly, incrementally, without removing households from the land where they're situated. In other words, not rollover upgrade, as it's called. And working around people's places where they live and activities which they do. Incorporating things like places for street traders, places for markets, places for creches. Um, what is important in a community upgrade may look very different to what is important in a professional formal formalization upgrade. We, uh, there's degrees of difference between these two. Um, but very often formalization is, is, is the way it goes. And it's a, a lot of it comes from this vision of what is a good environment in planners' eyes. So, uh, Professor Watson, I'm going to uh, thank you very much for spending these hour, these hour and a half with us. It's really been wonderful. I'm, I'm sorry we don't have the ability to interact uh, less formally after the talk here, but I hope you'll be willing to take emails from people and, uh, and, and perhaps to respond that way if folks want to continue the conversation. And uh, why don't you join me? Thank you, Dr. Watson. All right, I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, and close the session then. Bye. Bye. <laughs>